addiction specialist out of frustration at the cost addiction had in my life without me ever drinking or using drugs. But it's a part of why I am the weight I am, for example. And I recognize that, but I also recognize that the life of the loved one of an addict is a very hard life. And the life of an addict who doesn't know he or she is making other people's lives difficult can be a hard life. And the strategies for dealing with each other almost always fail. Addicted marriages fail near the top of all marriages that fail. And so it is important to understand that. And tonight, my hope is that you will leave here with a broader and deeper understanding of the impact of substances on the brain, why a person does the things they do that turn them into an addict, and most importantly, how to help those who are perhaps vulnerable to avoid addiction, and help those who are addicted to conquer it. Now, you won't get all of the answers tonight, but you'll get an idea that there is reason to be hopeful. And if there is anything that seems hopeless, it's life in the midst of addiction. Now, as you can read here and on your sheet, addiction is the result of ingesting substances or engaging in activities that, while seeming pleasurable, become compulsive. And it is most significant that you know it's a problem when it interferes with life. Now, it can cost jobs, it can cost marriages, it can cost families, it can cost freedom, and it can cost life. Yet people do it anyway. Why on earth would people take such risks? Because in my belief, humans are geared toward only two pursuits. Only two motivators. And it doesn't say this on the slides, but it's good for your notes. People are motivated either by the pursuit of pleasure or the avoidance of pain. In one way or another, our choices are governed by the pleasure or pain choice. The thing is, that the drive for pleasure can be so strong that people will take almost any pain in order to get that pleasure. And when that's what's going on, it makes addiction very difficult to deal with. In some laboratory studies from years ago, they would put mice in a maze or in, a, in an environment where by pushing a lever, they would get pleasure but at the same time they would get pleasure, a certain percentage of the time they'd get an electrical shock. In, in reality, they get the electrical shock every time, but they only get the jolts of pleasure one in a number of times. And they kept on pushing the lever, enduring the pain, in the hope of gaining the pleasure. When we understand that, we begin on the pathway of understanding addiction and understanding why the strategies that most people use to deal with it are not successful. Um, this graphic here shows you two brains. The brain on the left is a healthy brain. 
the brain on the right, the brain that looks a bit like Swiss cheese, is the brain of a 50-something alcoholic. And what you're seeing there is in the brain on the left, you're seeing blood flow to the entire brain. The regions are identified by colors to just so you'll know what's what. But on this, all of those areas are not getting, uh, are not getting blood flow, so therefore are not being fed, so therefore are not useful to the person. The brain has an amazing number of neurons. In order to get alcohol-related dementia, you have to drink an incredible amount of alcohol. Yet many thousands of people are in nursing homes and other places today because of uh, other institutions today because of alcohol-related dementia. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to consider who becomes addicted and how. You see here, it covers all races, all ethnicities. It doesn't show there, but it would also include all religious backgrounds. Uh, if you would want to do uh, research, as I, I do constantly, you would find that in Iran, a rigid Islamic country with opposition to substance abuse of every kind, they have tremendous problems at every level of society with addiction. In most religions, teach moderation or avoidance of substances. And people still use. Now, in order to appreciate addiction, it's really important to understand what creates the risk for addiction. And there are several conditions that are called predisposing conditions. I list ADHD first because overwhelmingly those students who struggle in school with paying attention they struggle with staying in their seat. They struggle with staying on task. Will, as teenagers, be among the first to experiment with substances. And the frustrating thing there, as we'll see again a little bit later, is that they begin on this path in the womb because most children who have ADHD are the children of mothers and fathers who smoked and drank during the period surrounding conception and pregnancy. Now, correlation, meaning that, that the things happening, doesn't necessarily imply causation, but I'll go out on a limb and say a mother smoking and drinking and a father smoking and drinking during the pre-pregnancy and pregnancy period creates an environment where ADHD is much more likely. Other kinds of what we call mental illnesses, badly chosen term because it prevents people from getting the help they need, but other forms of atypical functioning is what I like to call it. Um, other kinds of atypical functioning include OCD, obsessive compulsive, and they call it disorder. Again, I just call it being obsessive compulsive because it's the way the person's wired. If the person is working with the way they're wired, it's not a disorder. It's simply that they haven't learned how to adapt it so that they can get, get along well and work well with others. Uh, clinical depression, traumatic brain injury. These factors all contribute to a likelihood of using substances. The clinical depression piece is very important because people drink in order to feel good, but alcohol is actually a depressant. People use other drugs 
in order to get a good feeling. But the problem is, with all substances of abuse, it takes more and more of the substance in order to get the pleasure that's sought. One of the big indices of likely substance abuse is someone starting to smoke at somewhere under the age of 15. When they do, they're creating an environment in their brain where the substances of abuse such as cocaine, alcohol, opioids, have a greater impact because what actually happens is their DNA molecules decompress, making them more vulnerable. Now, um, genetic factors. We know, for example, that substance abuse tends to run in families. Some say, well, is it nature or is it nurture? Is it inborn or is it what they learned growing up as a response? The answer to the question is yes. It's both. There's specific genetic factors. Now, there's a word, a $3 word, which you can look up later, called epigenetics. And, and what happens is, at times, behaviors can trip certain genetic switches, so to speak, that lead to problems. It's not, it, it's not widely known, but some people become addicted to cigarettes from their very first puff on their very first cigarette. Think about that. That's a really good reason to never pick up a cigarette. Additionally, the use of alcohol is an example. Some people become alcoholics from their first drinking episode. Others become alcoholics over time by drinking too much and their body is set up to crave it. And there's actually multiple forms of addiction, but if I went over everything I could go over tonight, we'd be here until midnight and that probably wouldn't please anybody too much. Um, but other things lead to drinking or use of substances, such as experiencing traumatic events, our soldiers coming back from the war, people who experience sexual assault, people who experience other kinds of uh, traumatic exposure, like the people who on Sunday were in that church and survived the shootings, people who survived the shootings in Las Vegas, the peace officers that are responders, the first responders that come to scenes of accidents and things like that, people who are close to a family member that is suddenly taken, can all count those as traumatic experiences. And what can happen is a person can be resilient for the first three, four, five, six, ten events. But what happens is the impact of trauma can become cumulative, and so that can lead to addiction in a deeper way, or in a more, um, more, more certain way. Um, She's trying to get me to move on, but these are really important to understand. Other mental health issues, poor academic performance. If someone's doing poorly in school, get them help at the first stage you can. It's a helpful factor. Physical, psychological, and sexual abuse, an absence of goals, um, an absence of church or spiritual involvement are all things that put a person at higher risk. Okay, now... There is a lot of variableness in the data. This statistic comes from the National Institute of Health. But the problem is that it doesn't fully reflect the real problem. Because roughly 50% of those between the ages of 12 and 26 <coughs> use alcohol to an excessive level have used alcohol to an excessive level within the past month. Those of you who are raising children, please think carefully about that. 
That means keep a close eye. Okay. Um, the 15% is too low. Um, and the nicotine is an important factor. Uh, the 80% of smokers are also substance abusers is an important factor. And on the other hand, it is, um, I'm sorry, 80% of substance abusers are also smokers. It's not that, it's only about 50% of smokers abuse other substances. Interesting little factoid about, subs about smoking is that 47% of all active smokers live below the national poverty level. Now, is that because the smoking impairs their cognition? Yes. Would you mind repeating that? Yes. 47% of all smokers live below the poverty level. Thank you. Now, part of it is the money that they're spending on cigarettes limits them from doing other things that are consistent with growing wealth. <coughs> part of it is that employers no longer want to put them in better jobs. And part of it is that smoking starts to impair cognition beginning about five years after you start smoking. Really challenging thing. Is it a choice or is it a disease? I have gotten into more arguments about this than perhaps any other subject. And as the slide says, yes it is. It is a disease. There is something different about the brain of someone who becomes addicted as compared to the brain of a person that doesn't. There were, for example, in the Vietnam conflict, very interesting little thing. Roughly 50 to 60 percent of soldiers on the battlefield and Marines on the battlefield used heroin in Vietnam to a significant level. But only 5 percent came back to the states as addicts. The other 95 percent of the 50 percent came back and put the substances behind them. They didn't actually become addicted. The best we can do in understanding that is to understand that social concerns, family, the desire to get ahead, the desire to live a fruitful life, influence them, and their brains weren't among those who were hit by the epigenetic switch that made them a full-blown addict. Okay, what are some common addictions? The most common substance of abuse remains alcohol. Heroin is fast catching up. Uh, there's uh, other drugs. If you do any research on, on substance abuse at all, you'll see the letters AOD. That means alcohol and other drugs. And that's simply a shorthand for talking about all of the substances of abuse. And it's also important to understand that food, sex, gambling, hoarding, and shopping are all addictions. They all trigger the brain in a certain way in some people so that instead of being a reasonable or typical behavior, they're a problem behavior. It is, um, if you know it's becoming a problem, that's when to seek help and there is good help available. How do we treat it? Outpatient therapy. These, these estimates this is a rough idea, but I wouldn't take these to the bank. Most of the percentages are high, except for the 100%. 100% of people who die stop using. Um, effective coaching, I, I give it between 50 and 80% success. Um, I use hypnosis. Hypnosis has remarkable success in the hands of a skilled practitioner because it helps the person to reformat their brain. Cold turkey, um, doesn't say it up here, but uh, and that would include AA and all of that. It's down below 10%. Um, it's, it's very hard, very hard to get good numbers on AA because of course they don't like to be researched because they're protecting the privacy, the anonymous part of being an AA. But people who have 
worked hard to do studies have, have come to that conclusion. Lifestyle changes between 50 and 75 percent. When a person is addicted, but they get married or have a child, about half the time they're able to get, up, get off the substances, maybe a little more than that. But sometimes it's just a matter of their brains mature and they didn't start early enough to kill the judgment center. Um, one of the things that is important to understand is how to protect kids from drug abuse, from substance abuse, from smoking. And as I said before, prevention starts in the womb. It actually starts before conception. It's, it's, I, I want to be tremendously careful how I say this, because I do not want to cause offense. But I feel duty and honor bound to give good information. The fact is that smoking and the use of alcohol and other drugs adversely impacts the female reproductive system, both in terms of infertility and in terms of atypical birth patterns, miscarriage, stillbirth, and birth defects are all much higher among women that smoke and drink during pregnancy. But the ovaries can be damaged by alcohol before conception ever takes place. So I work very hard to encourage young women to seriously limit their use of alcohol. Um, the, next, uh, the next stage is early childhood. And you want to create a safe, secure, attached environment. If a child feels securely attached to mom and dad, they have a much better chance of facing substances with the ability to say, no thanks, or I've had enough. Whereas, if they don't feel safe and secure, they know they get a reliable buzz from drinking from smoking pot, from whatever. And um, by the way, marijuana should have been on the list of addictive substances. It is definitively addictive. Anybody who tells you that marijuana is not addictive is basing it on studies from the 70s and 80s. It is definitely addictive for some people. Okay. Um, now, when you're raising children, Mamas especially, and sometimes dads, don't like to think of their children as experiencing pain. So they want to do everything they can to help the child not experience pain. That means using pain medication. Guess what? Pain's a part of life. Get over it. You know, I, the other side of it is, if there's chronic pain, if there's intractable pain, if there is pain that makes life unbearable, then there are techniques that I can use in hypnosis, there are other counseling techniques to deal with it that can, can help you to, uh, to handle it without the risks involved with pain-killing drugs. And, and there's, a, there's an expression I learned when I was learning about pain management. This is worth writing down. Pain does not become pain until it reaches the brain. That is the underlying fact that governs the dispensing of medications. It interrupts the pain circuitry before it gets to the brain. Or it dulls the senses in the brain so much that you feel the pain but you don't care. And that's what opioids tend to do. Now, <laughs> if we can teach people, well, let me, let me give you an example. Is anybody here experiencing any kind of pain tonight, any kind of physical discomfort? Okay, one, anybody else? Okay, 
Um, you can't be seen on camera, so nobody knows it's you. Can you say where it is on a scale of 1 to 10? 6. 6. Okay, good. Very good. I'd like you to focus intently on the pain. And I'd like you to feel the discomfort and focus on it until it moves through 7 and up to 8. And when it gets to an 8, just give me the dirty look like, how dare I do this to you? The laughter kind of offsets it, but focus on it and feel it increase and just continue to focus on it. It's a, it's a little bit of a challenging environment to do that in, but has it increased at all? Okay. I'm not going to push it because of the constraints of time, but what I have found in my pain management work is about 90% of the time, when I ask a, a client to increase their pain by two points, within a minute, a minute and a half, they say, yeah, I'm there. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that our perception influences our experience of pain. And so if we can train our brains to respond differently, we don't have to have the level of drugs that we often take in order to deal with pain. Now, I'm my own best example on that. I had open heart surgery in 2007. And I really frustrated the doctors once I was out of ICU because I told them I didn't need the morphine. And they said, Mr. Pelletier, you can't heal as fast without deadening the pain. I said, I can handle the pain. I don't want the morphine. First of all, I come from a family of addicts, okay? My mother, my father, and all four of my brothers were addicts. Do you think I want to risk that? But the second thing is, and this is very important. I also wanted to use what I teach other people on myself to prove to myself as well as them that it works. I now have a dentist who's more than a little bit annoyed with me because I go in for a filling and he pulls out the Novocaine needle. I say, no thanks. He says, look, this is not just a small cavity. You're going to feel this. I said, no thanks. I'll tell you the truth. The pain never got above a five or six. And I was able to relax my way through it. And when I was done at the dentist's office, guess what? I didn't have a swollen mouth feeling. I felt very comfortable. I was much better off for doing that. But I've also trained myself to be able to do it. So yes, a good hypnotist, a good counselor can help you reach the place where you can get by with much less of what interrupts the feeling of pain in your body. And I know people that have, for instance, a severe motorcycle injury, one of my dear friends, and he lives with pain in his body that's at a constant 10. But through hypnosis, he has trained himself, because that pain is never going to go away, he's trained himself not to even notice it. And he himself is a well-known hypnotist. So I, I just want you to be aware of that. I'm not here just to sell the idea of hypnosis, but I wanted to give you a couple of good solid examples. Um, and it's really important also, in teaching your children to accept some pain, it is also important to pick up a crying child. It's also important to let a child know you care, <clears throat> to let them know you hear them and you understand what they're going through, even though um, uh, you can't do anything to take it away, but then you do something to distract them. And before too long, for the most part, even with a bee sting or something like that, they're pretty well handled. They've, they've adapted. But if they're crying and they get all kinds of cooing and attention, then they're apt to use it and milk it. Now, no one here has any kids who would milk anything, right? <laughs> and, and I certainly never milked anything if my brother's watching. Um, okay. Now, you also can learn to deal with emotional pain. And you can learn to adapt to situations. I am not a big fan of psychoactive drugs 
that are used in isolation from talk therapy. That is to say, excuse me, I'm not a big fan of a general practitioner prescribing antidepressants and not prescribing talk therapy with a professional counselor. Because if you go, if you deal with the symptoms of depression without dealing the cause of, with the cause of depression, you can create other difficulties. It actually confuses the mind. So, and um, the, the uh, I went out of sequence on the slides. You probably picked <laughs> up on that. But the principles are all the same. And dealing with emotional pain. And then finally, one of the things, and this may be hard for some people to take. There are people who don't believe there's a God. There are people who don't believe in a higher power. There are people who don't follow Christianity or any of the other major religions. And I respect their right to do that. But if you want to get one of the most potent protective factors into your kids' lives, <coughs> you will nonetheless involve them in a faith community because that is the number one non-family protective factor against addiction. Number one, outside of the family, outside of healthy family. So that's important to understand. Okay. Now, when you are helping your children to grow into functional adults, it is important that you teach them how to live in such a way that they experience some measures of success in their life. They experience some victories. Now, it might be a victory over a skill issue. You know, some people are not natural athletes. But if they can sink a basket, or they can hit a baseball or softball, or if they can catch a football, even a few times, that gives them a feeling that they're capable of doing things. And it might be, uh, I was challenged with numbers when I was a kid. I struggled with math. Now you can ask me, I can run a lot of numbers in my head. But back then, I didn't have the basics. Okay, so what you do is you help them experience success. But then you also push them beyond their ability level so that they also fail sometimes. They fall short. They, they, they miss the mark. Why is that so important? Because if you fall down, you have to get up. You haven't failed until you stop trying. And I would say that, by the way, with a person getting off substances as well. They may struggle, but they haven't failed until they stop trying. Okay, so we want to build that resilience. And, and you, you, resilience is one of the most important factors in dealing with PTSD, in dealing with marriage, in dealing with uh, work situations. And where, where does resilience, what is resilience, first of all? Resilience is what you see with a rubber band. You stretch a rubber band, you can stretch it so far and it won't break. You don't want to stretch it to the breaking point. It's not useful once it's been stretched to the breaking point. But by building strength, you can have much more resilience. Now, I realize I'm in upstate New York, so I'd probably be wiser not to mention this, but I can't help myself. I grew up in Greater Boston, Massachusetts. I'm a fan of the New England Patriots. All right, another one. Yay! Rhode Island. Oh, great, great. Okay. And what Tom Brady has done in the past five years is just amazing. You know, people keep expecting him to fall off. He's having his best season ever this year because he learned not to build stronger muscles, but to build more resilient muscles. He built his bounce back factor. Now that's all I'll say about the Patriots. Go Patriots! <laughs> um, but um, you can start on the path of success today. So now what do we do with the person who's already failed, who's already uh, addicted? How do we 
help them? What do we do for them? I've given you some of the information already interspersed throughout, but let's go through it in sequence now. If you have someone that you care about that is addicted, the first step must be detoxification. If someone came to me and said, Mr. Pelletier, I'll pay the $5,000 charge for your, uh, your hypnosis six-month program, but I'm going to self-detox. I'll say, boy, it's nice meeting you. I wish you every success, but please find someone else because if you don't medically detox, I don't want to be responsible and I'm not a medical professional and I don't pretend to be one. Mental health professional, yes, but not a medical professional. So you must detox and that doesn't matter what the drug is. You have to get it out of your system reliably and that's done through a combination of effects in a detox facility. Don't risk it. Step two, beginning right away, even before you detox, start building the skills that we've already mentioned that children need in order to be able to come off of substances. Now, there's some real issues with this as I say this. For example, as a counselor, as a marriage and family counselor, as a pastor, I would never encourage a couple to get back together if they've separated over substance abuse until the person has been sober, <coughs> clean and sober, for at least three years, and I prefer five. Now that leaves the addict feeling almost hopeless. But the danger is that the total way the marriage worked triggered the addictive response. So you have to get him well or her well away from the addictive response. And believe me, it's not just a masculine problem. There are many women who have the problem at as bad a level as men. Um, but it's important to begin the process of retraining the brain. Retraining the brain is a process, as we're going to see throughout this next section. We're going to now move to my, <coughs> one of my favorite things about the brain. This is the exciting news that we've only come to understand in about the last 25 years. To give you perspective, I majored in psychology and graduated college in 1976. I will stand here and tell you, with all the respect that I have for the professors who taught me, they had some nerve offering a major in psychology in 1976 with what they knew then compared to what we know today. But there's something else. As we look at this area of neuroplasticity, I want you to understand that we're at the beginning of understanding it. We are at the earliest stages of actually intentionally using neuroplasticity. We've only known about it for 25 years out of the thousands of years of human existence. We've known about it for 25 years. Do you realize how short a time that is, how little knowledge that represents? We're scratching the surface. I would love to be alive 40 years from now and have my daughter do the kind of study I've done, going back to school for another advanced degree, and then look back on what she learned graduating in 2006, and if she feels the same way I do about the degree I got in 1976, 30 years before, because I believe it's gonna be the same. And it's the same with everything to do with pharmacology, everything to do with drugs, all of that. We don't know enough to say we know anything for sure. What I say about anything to do with scientific inquiry is based on the current scientific knowledge. This is how we understand things to work. But a study could come out tomorrow that will shake everything I've said. I don't think so on most of what I've said tonight, but. Now, what is neuroplasticity? This thing that excites me and got me off on a little bit of a tangent there. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain 
to continue to develop new neural pathways until we die. Now, I had the very sad misfortune to lose a brother to Alzheimer's this year. It was, this has in many ways been one of the worst years of my life. But what I learned about Alzheimer's is we went through it with him for three years before he passed, was that once you reach a certain point, you can't stop it. You can't interrupt it. But there are, Alzheimer's actually starts in the brain 30 years before anybody realizes they've got it, that they're a candidate for it. So how do you protect yourself from it taking over your life and you winding up in an institution and you're, you're dying without really knowing what's going on? It is by continuing to do new things. Most important, most simple, most straightforward, learn a language. Learn another language. Back 25 years ago, when the computer age was getting its, its footing, I used to say that you would preserve the lives of those who retire if you gave them a computer when they retired, instead of a gold watch. Because the fact of learning to use a new technology would impact their brains. But what learn new skills. If you've always wanted to do woodworking, or you've always wanted to cook, or you've always wanted to do whatever, learn it. Keep teaching it. Little things, simple things. There's so many simple things to do. If you're right-handed, start today brushing your teeth with your left hand. It'll be uncomfortable at first, but you'll get used to it. If you're, again, do everything you can with your opposite hand. Go through photo albums. If you've got an older person in your life who's beginning to lose it, Go through photo albums with them. Get them to recall things from the past and build associations with the now. Build this, have your children with them when they go through the pictures so they can tell the stories from a long time ago. Because the last part of the brain to go in Alzheimer's is the oldest part. The newest stuff fades first. So by bringing new associations, you can actually help with the development of new neural pathways. Neuroplasticity also means that you can learn new ways of thinking. So instead of just always living with a depressive mindset, a depressive mindset, train yourself to write down three things you're grateful for every morning. Train yourself to find something to be happy about. Train yourself to find something good about someone you care about. And you'll create an environment where your brain actually builds the new neural pathways that enhance your life. Now, how do you help those who are in recovery, those who are trying to conquer their addiction? Realize that their addiction is theirs. Now, put into practice the good brain health principles in your own life, and that includes healthy eating, 30 to 40 minutes of hard physical exercise a day, um, Keeping your, if you're in a relationship, uh, marriage, keeping your intimate life going. Um, all of those things contribute to healthy brain. Stagnating in those areas contributes to unhealthy brain. Eat healthy. Get rid of anything in your diet that has preservatives in it. Get rid of anything in your diet that's raised with hormones. Get rid of anything in your diet that is filled with antibiotics. Because those are brain harmful. So brain healthy behavior is very, very important. It is also, there's, there's one thing, I asked Amanda to put this in that slide with the percentages of success, and I asked her to put down at the bottom, nagging your partner about their substance use, except there'd be nothing to put in the graph, because it never works. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it probably would, you know, so. I, I don't want to. I don't want to go on and on about that. But nagging doesn't help. Okay, prayer yes, nagging no. Now another thing to be aware of is remember when we were talking about children, I talked about small successes and help them to build success upon success. Mm -hmm. 
when I help people stop smoking, in their first session, I want them to stop smoking. But I don't necessarily think that all of them are going to stay on from the first session. But what if they come back in a week or two, and they say, you know, I was good for the first three days. I was good for the first week. But then I weakened. That gives me information I can use to help them further. But I ask them, so how, how long ago was the last time you went a week without a cigarette? Chances are it was years. I say, okay, we can build on that. Now let's try and get to at least two weeks. Even if you feel a strong craving at week one, fight the craving and get yourself to week two. And then I give them hypnotic suggestions to support it and so forth. And you can get people off. Some people are gradual reduction smokers. You can help people stop. That's just an example expecting the uh, stop start pattern. Um, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they'll tell you that falling off the wagon is just another step on the road to recovery. But what happens is people want to say, but they know what it's doing to them and what it's doing to their family. Why do they do that? Substance abuse is not a knowledge thing. It's an addiction. Their brain is wired differently. Their genetics are different. Their way of processing is different. And so the reasoning isn't going to work. They have to decide and then they have to build their toolbox for success. It can be done. It is done every day. But you have to be prepared for the stop-start pattern. Increasing brain health is important for everybody. I gave you some of the secrets and I I mentioned this one in particular because it's a way of getting to successes. It is very important to focus on what's good in your life, that for which you're grateful. Grateful to God, grateful to your spouse, grateful to your children, whoever you're grateful to. If, if you have an attitude of gratitude, that can actually interrupt the depression mindset. Depression is a mindset. There is a skill to remaining <coughs> depressed. Okay? And there is a skill you can learn to bring yourself to help. Again, I am fine with antidepressant medications as an example, but only as a tool to get a person on the pathway towards uh, chemical balance in their bodies and the ability to deal with their problems. Okay, and that's done through talk therapy. I don't support their use without supporting talk therapy. I throw it out as a 30-day challenge. For everybody that's here tonight and everybody that's watching online, why not decide for 30 days I'm going to make a point of writing down three things that I'm grateful for and insofar as it's possible I'm going to try to come up with new things every day. It might take work, but it'll probably be a lot easier than you think. And watch the change in 30 days. So it's not stupid. Okay. Other things to do. Eliminate sugar from your diet. Now, Amanda typed up these slides. But <laughs> I have to confess, it's also not my favorite. I really like my sweets. But... Though you don't know me, but I'm down about 80 pounds since January. Okay. Amanda knows that because she's known me for three years. Um, use only meats grown without growth hormones and antibiotics. That's very important. Limit caffeine. Caffeine, it adversely impacts the brain. Understand that you can train your brain to think differently. Okay, I, I do want to mention something that we brought for you today. Um, there is a, um, a, a group called ACES, and it's a group that studies adverse childhood experiences. Okay, and we created um, a copy of their suggested 10 question survey. And um, uh, Dave, if you would pass that out, one out to everybody, I'd appreciate it. Oh, you all have it? Okay. See, way ahead of me. But go ahead and look over the list. And do you have them too? Okay. And see how many are true of you. 
and I'm not going to try and violate your privacy or anything, but just look it over and see how many, how many are true for you. If there are zero, then you have a really good start on your list of things for which to be grateful. And there's a possibility some people are actually triggered by this survey, but it's, it, it gives us an important insight. You didn't put the insight on the printout. Good. Just take a minute to give you a chance to, we'll take a minute to just give you a chance to complete that. And you have my email address on your screen, lee at breakingyourbarriers.today. If you're watching online or watching this on video and you would like a copy of that survey, I will be glad to provide one to you. Uh, you can also visit our Facebook page at Breaking Your Barriers on Facebook. So um, just, uh, I, I'm going to give information without <laughs> asking because I don't want anybody to have to reveal themselves in any way that's uncomfortable for them. But the national statistics compiled by ACEs say that those who check off more than four, four or more items are almost always on a path to death 20 years younger than the general population. So that, that, that tells you two things if you look at this survey. The first is, immediately involve yourself in self-care. The second, and, and other, getting the care you need, in other words. The second is, make sure that no children that you know of are living with this experience without you at least finding some way to be of help if you possibly can. I'm not trying to put people under undue pressure. It, it takes a trained professional to deal with it, so beyond just being aware of it, sometimes it's best just to report. Because this is life or death for the kids. And those things all also increase with each number above one. Your likelihood of using substances almost doubles. Abusing substances. Okay, so now, any questions? Any comments? Good job. That was really good. good. I have I have a question about um, alcohol-induced Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little bit more about that? When people, so say there's a nursing home and somebody has Alzheimer's, is there any difference between alcohol-induced Alzheimer's versus your traditional dementia that you would get from aging? The families of people who are in with alcohol-induced Alzheimer's know it. Mm. Okay. And I, I'm going to just share, share a couple of pieces of information with you that will help you to understand. The, um, there, there's two areas where being female is decidedly different than being male. Okay. One is smoking and the other is the use of alcohol. These are particularly strong areas. First of all, every cigarette smoked by a woman does twice the damage to her body as the same cigarette smoked by a man. Every time. Always true. Now, before you think I'm being sexist or anything like that, it's very simple and very obvious why that's true. All of the organs in a woman's body are smaller than they are in a man's body. Okay, all of the blood vessels, because a woman's body is overall smaller, there are fewer blood vessels and they're smaller. And the same amount of nicotine, therefore, or the same amount of tar and nicotine is therefore filling a smaller space. That's why you notice a woman's appearance suffers much more than a man's appearance does from the same volume of smoking over the same period of time. Okay, so that's the first one. The second one is at least as critical, but way under understood. The liver is where alcohol is processed in the human body. Okay, that's the filter for alcohol. A man's liver can filter as many as three drinks in a day. Once you go over the three drinks, you're 
organs are being directly attacked by the alcohol, most particularly the most important three pounds up here between your ears. Okay? Now, remember I said women are different. Women, again, get over twice the hit from the use of alcohol. A woman's body can basically filter one drink per day. And that's one glass of wine, one bottle of beer, one shot, however. We have this ridiculous thing that we do in our culture. We let beer and alcohol companies visit our college campuses and provide alcohol and other drugs, other um, alcohol to, to students who are still at the ages where their brains are most vulnerable to the problems caused by alcohol. I get so frustrated by this because it, 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 it's natural for kids between the ages of 10 and up to want to engage in risky behavior, male or female. Because they're trying to find out what works, what's really risky, and, and, and they're just trying for new experiences. And so what this does, just to, to relate it to the original question on Alzheimer's, is what this does is drinking, a man drinking more than three drinks at a setting, and you know at parties they might do, try to do six shots in an hour sometimes so you can get drunk the fastest. But what this does is the unfiltered alcohol getting to your brain kills brain cells. We have an abundance of brain cells. A person who gets alcohol-related Alzheimer's might have drunk a fifth of whiskey a day for 20 years to get him or herself there, or 30 years to get him or herself there. Okay, you, you, you almost have to work at it to get there. But regular Alzheimer's, not so. And Alzheimer's is a growing problem, which brings us back to why try to work with it. Because Alzheimer's is very expensive to treat unsuccessfully. And so you want to do everything you can. The, the strategies I've mentioned tonight will push your getting of Alzheimer's off until just after your funeral. And that's the way you want to do it. Okay, if you can delay its onset until you're 90 or 100, you probably weren't going to get there anyway. Mm -hmm. So, okay, yes? Um, I was interested, and I applaud you for putting sugar on the list. Um, and uh, because I think it's interesting, there's one study that I heard about that there were, uh, it was a <coughs> laboratory rat study, um, and actually sugar has itself as an addictive sub of substance, yes. and even more so than heroin. And it's also, um, uh, it feeds so many other uh, ills that our society faces with cancers and so on and so forth. Um, so I just, That's um, right. I was pleasantly yes. surprised to actually see it on the list. And it's something that is a huge challenge because it's in everything from not even the, the tasty cakes or at the soup at the uh, convenience store, but you know, salad dressings and some of these other sorts of things where you wouldn't expect to see them. Absolutely correct. Absolutely. It's in toothpaste, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so and, and we consume way too much sugar. Now, I'm going to say something very unpopular. <coughs> there is absolutely no good reason to drink any kind of soda pop. There is no good reason to drink any kind of soda pop. That means sugar-free is, sugar-free is worse for you mm -hmm. than sugar and sugar is bad for you. There is no reason, if you can get soda pop out of your life and you would like to get rid of weight, you will probably, without doing anything else, lose 20% of the weight you want to lose at least. Okay, there is no reason to drink soda pop. Candy, one of the things she mentioned in, in her comment is that it feeds other, other things. Sugar actually inflames your joints. It inflames arthritis. The best thing a person with arthritis can do is give up sugar. Let alone what happens when people become diabetic. Any other comments or questions? I had one more. Um, so I'm a youth advocate and I'm on a whole bunch of boards and stuff and it, I feel like you and I are kindred spirits, but it kills me with the culture that we live in right now where weed is so like totally cool and popular and normalized 
Um, I'm just curious what how you feel about that, and what are your what efforts have you made personally to like like I have, like we all have. I know Amanda um, to debunk all that bullshit, frankly. Yes, and it is. <laughs> and and what happened? The people will argue that weed is cool. It's better for you than booze. Right. Saying that one poison is going to kill you more slowly than another poison is not necessarily the best thing to be advocating for. Right. You don't want either poison. And if you could see, I, I, I couldn't get, there just wasn't room in the presentation, but I have, I have slides of the brain on pot. There's a slide I have available of an 18-year-old's brain that looks like an 80-year-old's brain because he's been smoking pot. Okay, and over time, pot is addictive, but one of the things to understand is the thing we've said three times now about epigenetics. We don't know whose switch is going to be tripped by what smoking a pot. And what else isn't known is that the pot that's available today is so much more powerful than the pot that was available when I was in college. And I didn't smoke in college, I went to, <laughs> got kicked out if I had. But, but I, I was one that, I turned down the opportunity to smoke pot. I was invited out to do so in, in high school, 1970. I chose not to. I'm thankful I did because I know the addiction in my family. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I also know I like to feel good. You know, I, <laughs> It was hard to turn down the morphine. Yeah, I, it, I mean, you know, I, I like pleasure. But the only one I give in on sometimes is food, and I'm trying to get that under control. So, yes, I totally support what you said, and I'm a tremendous advocate for it. And those who, what's going to happen is there's going to be a sharp line of demarcation 20 years from today between those who grew up smoking pot and those who grew up substance-free. And those who grew up smoking pot are basically going to be that generation's people of non-productivity. And that's in part due because of the increasing strength of the, the, the cannabis and all of that. So yeah, I'm very strong on that. I just find it's challenging now because it's so culturally acceptable and cool and popular. And, and not just with kids, it's not just peer pressure anymore, it's, you know, everyone we see in, in the media, pop culture, and all that stuff, like totally normalizing it, and I mm -hmm. want to stab them all in the eyes, so. I, 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 <laughs> I support you're not doing what you want to do. Right. I but I also them. understand the feeling. It's okay. frustrating. It's really frustrating. It is because it's based on bad information. Mm -hmm. Look, the National Institute of Health only reports the best science available. You might not want to <laughs> believe that, but they do. Read what they say about addiction to marijuana, okay? If you, a very simple way to know if you're addicted is how much do you look forward to your next time when you're going to smoke? How much time and effort do you get to put to getting to the place where you can smoke? Mm -hmm. How much thought do you give it? How much time do you think about it? If all of those are at a level of intensity, then you're addicted. If it just happens, somebody hands you a joint and you smoke it, and then you don't care the next time you get one, you don't have a problem, but you could. Yeah, and a lot of facilities now, because um, I work with a lot of young people, are saying, oh, he only does weed. These are, these are recovery facilities. We'll say, oh, we think it's just recreational for him. He doesn't need help. What? That is so <laughs> frustrating because it, is, it was always the gateway drug to other drugs. And remember, one of the things we know about substances of abuse it takes an increasing amount to get the same effect. Mm -hmm. That's why they had to increase the amount of cannabis, or um, um, cannab cannabinitol, and um, oh, there's, there's another word that I'm looking for, but it's not popping to mind, but um, that are the active ingredients in pot. THC. And, hmm? THC. THC, thank you. THC, um, <coughs> it... The way it impacts the brain, and the way it takes more, and then people turn to other substances. Mm -hmm. I didn't spend any time on, but one of my great frustrations, I, I talked a lot about pain management, but I didn't speak to my frustration at the medical establishment 
that prescribe so many opioids because they're so highly addictive. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we really have to do something. You have to, people have to decide, I can endure the pain of whatever is wrong with me more than I can endure the pain that would be caused by my dying of a heroin overdose and all of the behaviors that would lead up to it. Because that's basically the, the decision tree. I'm going to be blunt. Perfect. Our criminal justice system is better than it has ever been for a system that is so horrible at what it does. And by that I mean that they do not track their results, they do not know what percentage of people go back to using once they're out of incarceration, they don't track the methods that are used in, when incarcerated in order to support freedom from addiction. So yes, you, and, and they don't do neuroimaging studies. Reason? Cost. Excuse me. But the cost of incarcerating someone is upwards, I think, of $100,000 a year. A brain study done at the Amen Clinic is $3,600. You could send them all to the Amen Clinic, and if, they, if half of them do better, you've more than paid the cost. You could hire people to come in to the prisons and do it. It is positively ridiculous that we don't do better at preparing people for freedom. And they are trying hard, but they're trying hard using old models, and they're not using the best science, because it seems of necessity that governmental entities can never be using the best science. They have to be using dated science. And it drives me bonkers. So yes, <laughs> people see this, I'm gonna be sunk in certain areas. <laughs> I'll take it. Well, you'll, you'll gain respect in other areas. So it's a, I, I, I know a great deal about what's being done in that area. And I would love to design the studies that would track this. I really am a big believer that we need to be doing... I, I believe everybody who does therapy for addiction, whatever description, they should be responsibly tracking their results so we can get a better handle on what works and what doesn't. I think it's positively ridiculous for people to pay large sums of money to companies, to businesses, to entities, to get people uh, clean and sober, but then have no way to track their actual results. As far as we can tell, the success rates for most uh, detox entities somewhere around 10 percent 15 percent and that's when you pay fifty thousand dollars for a 28 day stay okay i am i am so disgusted with that you have no idea i just i i, I really believe that everybody in mental health has a responsibility to track their their processes and see how they're doing other than that they're just taking people's money and you know hoping they help I don't see how you can say you've done anything without tracking results. So a piggyback question is, do you think that successful addiction treatment can happen within um, the institution of addiction? Absolutely, unequivocally, yes. Okay. But it has to be handled in a way that they become a place where someone will almost do something to get in so that they can get their life together when they get out. They could do so much better in the criminal justice system, but the trouble is that, that the general public is just as happy to have it be a place of storing people that are socially undesirable. And until there is a demand that we do better, we're going to do about the same. I mean, what, just what we've learned about neuroimaging, through neuroimaging, not about neuroimaging, but because of neuroimaging in the last five to seven years, could revolutionize treatment in the criminal justice system. There are so many possibilities. And I, I, I think that, honestly, I think when a person, now this is going to really get me into trouble probably, but I think when a person's incarcerated, 
they only they should only have limited rights to say no to being studied because we have to help their their heirs their their genetic heirs to to not wind up incarcerated you know, I, I I just really feel like it, it's 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 a wasted opportunity how would you go about uh, studying them so that you could help them in that way well the first thing to do is to do the kind of thorough intake advocated by um, successful uh, mental health brain health practitioners and that means a very detailed background for example um, the highest possible percentage unbelievably high percentage of incarcerated individuals score very high on the ACEs uh, assessment that we just did. Okay, they score remarkably high. But what happens is that people uh, don't seem to have a very effective plan for dealing with these ACE events, these adverse childhood events. I, I put a lot of responsibility on our culture's churches and, and other social institutions. I think a very important development in the school systems is the increasing provision of mental health services to students because it's very important that you get to someone when they're very young, 5, 6, 7, 10, 13 years old, rather than waiting for them to run up against the criminal justice system. Get them really good quality services. Get really well get really empathic and caring professionals that they can talk to and will want to talk to that are helping them achieve good results. Please, people need to understand, we have made tremendous progress in the area of mental health, in the area of helping people develop healthy thought processes. But you have to get therapy in order to benefit from it. And hypnosis is a wonderful tool. Training yourself in self-hypnosis you don't have to come to me. Look up self-hypnosis online. Learn what you can. You can train your brain. Can you describe... Um, oh, I don't think I adequately answered okay. your question on what I would do, by the way. And I'm sorry about that. I got off on a hobby of yours because this is stuff I'm very passionate about. But what I would do is after I do the intake, I would have a thorough understanding of where the individual is and I would begin the process of goal setting with the individual. Again, they do goal setting in the prison system. But I would do more detailed goal setting, more measurable goal setting, the old SMART goal principles, you know, significant, measurable, um, uh, achievable, realistic, and timely. Okay? Though the, the, something like that, whatever SMART acronym you like. But then you design, I, I want to see us take advantage of what we're learning about the regions of the brain that respond. And I believe that we can design those, uh, those electrodes that, uh, that, that for EEG response. I believe we can run an active EEG on people while they're receiving therapy so the therapist will know how the individual is responding in reality instead of just um, guessing by the words that the person says. And the other thing is, when a person lies, different areas of the brain light up than light, light up when they're telling the truth. So you could gain a lot of information. Is it going to be expensive? Of course it's expensive. But incarceration is expensive. So, so that, that gives you an idea, and I think we need to individualize design therapy so that people have a real chance of success and give them hope that when they get out, they can have a different life. I also think that we have to do a much better job of developing placement opportunities for people who've been incarcerated because business people are rightly cautious. Do they want to bring somebody into their business that went to jail for embezzlement? Yeah, I just wonder, you know? But we, we have to find places where they can go. We have to give them realistic opportunities where they can grow. And, and really, you know, if we can get them beyond the criminal mindset and the choice to do criminal behavior when good behavior would serve them better, you know, but that's what we do in therapy. That's what we strive for. Can you describe what happens during a typical hypnosis session? Sure. Um, what happens during a typical hypnosis session is the session starts before it starts. You're engaging with the person and you begin engaging the subconscious mind virtually immediately because you want to build rapport and trust. Everything that you do in hypnosis, as in other forms of therapy, 
is reliant on the rapport between you and the person. As you build the rapport, you do that by relating to them, by listening to them. Uh, one of the things that all who are taught therapy are taught to do is to listen very carefully to what the client says and to give it back to them. And then you begin the process of asking for permission. May I ask you to go into a trance? May I invite you to go into a trance? And then you use whatever methodology seems to fit. You can put a person in a trance in five seconds, five minutes, or 50 minutes, depending on the person, depending on what the person's comfortable with. And, and, and again, just talking to me. If you notice right now the pace, the cadence, and the tone of my voice is changing. And that's me moving into hypnotic voice. Now, Hypnotic voice is not magical, but it's fascinating. And what happens when a person gives consent to go into trance, their subconscious mind accepts the permission. And it is not hard to get most people to go into trance. When they're in the trance state, you've already elicited from your intake the goals they want to achieve, so you use the goals they want to achieve as a part of the suggestion process for what you're going to be doing with them. And you plant post-hypnotic suggestions. Some people will remember what you talked about, and some people won't. It's a matter of their preference. It's a matter of what the type of suggestion is that you're giving them, the process you're dealing with. There are many things that hypnosis is used for beyond just straight therapy. It can be used for memory recovery. It can be used, a person doesn't realize everything that they've seen, say, when they've witnessed an accident or they've witnessed some other kind of event or even been victimized by someone. They think that all they saw if someone's pointing a gun at them is the gun. In reality, their brain took in everything around it, but the gun was their focal point. You can use trance to um, help them to see beyond the gun and see what else is going on in the room. But you have to be very careful doing that. There's ways of doing that that have to do with admissibility of evidence and so forth. Um, and I kind of rambled a little bit on that, but I kind of wanted to give you some different, different scenarios. In terms of stop smoking, for example, one of my very strong suits is um, some people like to use aversion therapy. I like to use some aversion with everybody because there's so many horrible things in tobacco. I like to make them aware of the fact that there is a... And there's no limit by the Food and Drug Administration of the amount of human and animal excrement that can be in tobacco. <coughs> and everybody who's ever smelled stale cigarette smoke knows that it smells a little bit like there might have been some excrement there. Mm. So all I want to do is make the client more aware that the reason it smells like excrement once the perfuming agents are gone is because there's actual excrement there. So, did that make sense? Did I address your question? Absolutely. Uh, what's going on in a, a person's uh, brain when they're in a trance? Okay, that's a very good question. And, and, and uh, as long as nobody else minds, I don't mind, okay? Um, uh, so, what's going on is a, a person is not asleep. Hypnosis is, as to its name, a misstatement because it is not sleep. It's not even similar to sleep. Your brain is actually more active in hypnosis than it is when you're asleep, and often it's more intensely active than when you're in a normal state of wakefulness. And what's going on is the person is interpreting what you're saying. Now, I've had many interesting experiences with that because I've made these wonderful, elaborate <coughs> suggestions. And I've had people tell me after the session, you know, I, I, I really liked what you did, but this is what I did with it, which wasn't what you said to do with it. And it worked for them. I don't care so long as it works, because we're all individuals. We all respond individually. But in answer to the basic of your question, the mind is more active in hypnosis, but it's active different. Okay. You guys want to ask a question? No, they want to go home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, also to, to kind of bring light to the, to kind of put the stigma on hypnosis. I mean, it's not it's speaking to somebody talk like a chicken or something like that, it's, it's constructive in the goal that you're trying to achieve. Yes. So there's the, the, the negative connotation of hypnosis could be put to bed. Well, I, I, I agree with you and I support what you're saying, 
as far as it goes. But I'm also a very good stage hypnotist. And I do get people to do things that surprise themselves. Um, I've had a situation in the Midwest when I was on my last Midwest tour where an autistic boy volunteered. I didn't know he was autistic. And he did everything the uh, neurotypical students did. And he came off after the, after the performance was over and he said, Mr. Pelletier, they're telling me I did this dancing thing. I didn't do that, did I? He said, well, do you want to see the videotape? And he said, but, that, but, 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 but they said I sniffed Charlene's hair. I wouldn't sniff Charlene's hair. I'm, I'm mesophilic, I'm germophobic. Yeah, well, that's not what the video says. And, and so I had, I had a good interview with him after now. I didn't get a signed release, so I can't show anybody the video um, of that part. I can show the show, because that's part of the show contract. But you can get people to release their inner thespian. Now, I've never used the click like a chicken. Just not my thing. But chair dancing, dancing with stars, you know, uh, slurping an ice cream cone, I've done that, and it's fun. I, I, I think some people may have even seen some of my performances, so. I wanted to jump back. So um, you are talking about the ACEs assessment and um, having had an opportunity to read through the items. Um, I'm just wondering if there's anything you know, especially if someone is, is going to, if they're scoring high on this, um, what mitigating factors are there? Because a lot of these, these are things that are typically, they're out of control of the individual who is experiencing them. Um, so you mentioned that, you know, four and above was sort of the, the magic number. So what oh, no. do you do? One and above is the magic number. Okay. Okay. It's just that statistics show that those above four tend to die 20 years earlier than the general population. Okay, so in answer to your question, everything that we just said uh, in, the, in the presentation, the eight steps, um, it is that you want to do everything that you can to build resilience. You want to do everything that you can to give the person a sense of purpose. You can, you can help them decide, you know what, I didn't like growing up this way. I don't want to raise my children this way. That was my decision. I wasn't going to raise my child in the home of an alcoholic. I just wasn't going to do it. You're too rich. But I had religious involvement. My four brothers had much less. They had some, but much less. And I had a sense that my life was for a greater purpose than just my own immediate pleasure. And I think that's something that you have to convey. Sorry for the emotion. Sometimes it just comes out. <laughs> it is live. I know. Can't no. stop it. No, no, it's, it's, it's live. It's That's real. Beautiful. It's the real thing. Yeah. 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 So. And and just so you know, like I was asked um, this past <coughs> a year ago, how did you do it? How did you grow up in that environment and be? the one that didn't become an addict. And I can only, I, I have to give God's credit. You know, I have to give God credit that he protected me. I, I was constantly in environments that were more protective than risky. When my parents found out I turned down going to smoke pot, they were absolutely thrilled that I had turned it down. And my brothers wanted to know, like, all right, who, whose kid are you anyway? So, I mean, you know, they, they, they like to harass. I was the youngest of five boys. <laughs> so. I'm sure that was part of your strength, watching what they went through. Mm. I would like to think, mm. at least. Yeah, to a point, but I wasn't, they, they actually, none of them drank heavily. <coughs> that I, the two, it, it's hard to, to explain, but they weren't, like my parents were, 
when I was still living at home. Okay, and they were. Their, their substance abuse evolved as they went into their 30s and 40s. They used substances young, and they used many more substances than I did as a teenager. I mean, I, I did drink some beer as a teenager, but um, so I can't quite say that. I really think it was the, the sense of call, the sense of purpose, and the absolute desire not to do that to my child. And that's important. That's a, that's a very strong motivator. If you're talking to someone who's in that kind of situation, the thing you want to get across to them is that they have choices all the way up. They have the choice not to use. Just because everybody else does doesn't mean they have to. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for the wonderful questions.